stand up on your feet, oh. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity one more time, dear God, to come together to learn about your word, to expound on your word, Father, and to learn about our nine life shapes. Father, as we embark on this journey, I pray that we open our hearts and open our minds, that we may see you more clearly, walk with you more nearly, and love you more dearly. These are the things that we ask, we seek, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just a quick recap from last week. Uh, last week we went over the life-shaped circle. The life-shaped circle begins our opportunity um, and it begins to teach us how to have a repentant life. How to begin to uh, embrace our learning experiences in life so that we can come to a place where we can observe, reflect, and discuss different situations in our lives so that we can develop a plan, be accountable to God, and then activate that plan in our lives. And we call that shape the life shape circle. We, we talked about the Kairos moment. Also last week we talked about this thing called kingdom. Because we hear, I hear a lot of folk talking about kingdom and most time Christian folk don't understand what kingdom is. So I wanted to identify the four different types of kingdom that are identified in the Bible. The Garden of Eden, which was a kingdom that was created and designed by God for man. When we got kicked out of that kingdom, then we fell up under the rule of the kingdom of God, which rules everything and every other kingdom. All right? Then we have the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven was created at the same time the kingdom of, the, of earth was created for man in the Garden of Eden. The kingdom of heaven was created for God's angels and spirits. All right? And then we have the kingdom of man, because after we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, which was the original kingdom designed for man by God, we got kicked out. So God said, I'm going to give you another kingdom and let you have your own governmental system. And that's the kingdom of man, the system of government that we are dealing with right now. And just to recap from last week, we understand that we have the life-shaped circle. And in this life-shaped circle at the top, we have Jesus and grace. At the bottom, we have you and me, and we have mercy. And in the life shape circle, and we look at this as a repentance life shape, all right, because we want to be able to go to God and repent for our sins. And we often find ourselves that we have to observe, reflect, and discuss. And that's on the repentance side. And on the faith side, on the belief side, we have our plan, our accountability, and our action. And grace at the top, mercy at the bottom. And what happens is we go through life, and as we look at different situations, we're able to observe, reflect, and discuss those situations. By God's mercy, it propels us to our faith, which allows us to develop a plan, to be accountable, and then activate our plan, which propels us back to grace. And then after we get through all of that, we find ourselves that after we have conquered whatever that may be, it could be, let's say, drinking, okay, as an example. After we have conquered that and God has delivered us from drinking, all of a sudden we find out now that we have a thing with cursing. So, it's just, so then we start the process over again, and we just continue to go through this process, and that's why you have that little slinky thing, because you're always going through it. You're always going through it. It's like Elder Lucy and I was discussing this during the week, and, and she shared with me that God showed her a lemon, um, not a lemon, but a, a, I, I, an, an onion. And when you remove the first skin or the first layer of the onion, you go to another layer. And after you get to that layer, but if you in that process get to that second layer, but then you go back and re-embrace the first skin that you remove, the repentance process stops. And basically you have to start all over again because you've re-embraced the first thing that you just got over. So now you've got to go back and get re-delivered and get restarted all over again so you never get, re you never get delivered from the, first one, from the second one because you never fully were delivered from the first one. And that's why we have this life-shaped circle because it visualizes 
how you can go through that over and over again. But God, because of Jesus and his grace and his mercy, he will propel you to get you through. Amen? That's the Life Shape Circle. Today, we're going to go ahead and dive right in to the Life Shape Semicircle. Okay? The Life Shape Semicircle, all right, and I'm going to turn this around so that everyone can get a good view of it. Is that better so everyone can see? Yeah. Is that better? All right. Kind of do it like this. Move these back here. All right? Because I want everyone to get an opportunity to see. And these are also in your handbook. So if you would, in your handbooks that I gave you out today, that we can all follow along and be on the same page, because you don't even have to take notes in this class. We pretty much, well, there are some notes that I want you to take, but for the most part, go with me to page number nine. Page nine. Page nine. Page nine has us on the semicircle. And one of the four things that we're going to do today, at the end of this class, you should be able to um, let's make that an end, huh? Got to add an end in here. I want you to learn your true relationship as designed by God between work and rest. The second thing I want we're going to be able to do is we're going to learn how to abide in Christ. Very, very important. The third one is we're going to discover the value of times of pruning. That's one of the most difficult parts of a Christian's life is when God begins to prune and remove things from your life, things that we really don't want to let go of. And we're going to develop plans to apply the semicircle to our life. And that's basically what we're going to do, all right, on, on today's thing. So we'll all take a look at the board over here. We live very busy lives in this time between work, between school, between the children, between church, between all the stuff that we have in our lives, we live a very, very busy and complicated life. The world has a skewed view on our rhythm or on what we're supposed to do. Work has become a quintessential part of our lives, so important that we have gotten out of the rhythm of life that God originally designed. Now, we all know, or many of us do know, that have read the Bible and, and know some of the stories in the Bible, know about the time when God created the heavens and the earth and he created man. On the sixth day, God created man. Amen? Everybody with me on that? On the sixth day, God created what he called his crown jewel, his, his crown creation. He, he took all the time that he needed and he created man. On the seventh day, God rested. So in other words, our first full day with God, the very first day that man had with God was a day of rest. Now God designed man with the purpose of working. He put us in the Garden of Eden and he said, work, tend to this land. But the very first day that we had with God was a day of rest. Now the world would have us doing it backwards. The world got us thinking that we've got to work and then rest. But God has it exactly the backwards. He says rest and then work. The Sabbath day is a day of rest. And it's even in the Ten Commandments. It's a day that God said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And as we move into society, remember 30 years ago, you could not find anything open on Sunday, including Burger King and McDonald's. Nothing. Now, the work environment actually requires some people in retail that they have to work on Sunday. In fact, you couldn't find anything open on Christmas. And has anyone noticed lately, slowly, that things are opening up on Christmas, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving? They're slowly taking what God had intended for us to have periods of rest. And they're making us believe that it's no longer rest, that you have to work. In other words, they want us to work 60 or 70 years of our life and then go on retirement. Mm -hmm. I'm fully convinced that when we get to heaven, we're going to be workers. God has stuff for us to do in heaven. So we're not going to be able to go back and kick back with our feet right, up and, right. and, and chill yeah, out with yeah, Jesus. Yeah. There's work for us to do. Yeah. We were designed for work. Yeah, yeah. But we weren't designed to work and not rest. Yeah. 
And when we rest in God, and when we get to that period where we can, re we can truly hear from God, and that's why we're so topsy-turvy now, because we don't take that time out to rest and hear from God. The Sabbath has all gone away. Even on Sunday that we consider to be our day of Sabbath, many of us labor on that day. When it really should be a day of rest, a day that we go back and we spend with our families, a day that we block everything out, and with social media and with the access to all the other gadgets that we had, it follows you around. You can't even go home right now and get good rest. Do you know that in a real rest environment, there should be no light in your room? I can't sleep now without television on, which is, a, which is the craziest thing. I'm, I'm not really resting because they have proven that when the television lights in you, you never fully reach a REM sleep. You never really get that rest. And do you know a lack of rest will kill you? Mm -hmm. It will eventually kill I know people, I only need two hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. And have you ever looked at them physically? They look tore up from the floor. They, 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 they look 70 when they're 50. They do. Because God had not designed us. It's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. We know when the animals go around and they say that it's programmed in the animals and it's a natural animal instinct that they do this and do that. Well, if God designed animals like that, don't you think he designed us to be that way too? That he put some DNA in us, he put some program stuff in us, and one of those programs was rest. And we're not getting adequate rest, both in the natural and in the spirit. So, what God has done here, and it looks like a little pendulum, that's why it's a semicircle, because we should be able to balance our rest from our work. And what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about that here a little bit. Go over some quick key words for us right here. Some of the key words, human beings and human doings. We're going to talk about rest and work. We're going to talk about abiding and faithfulness. And we're going to talk about pruning and growing. Do you know that when you prune a tree and you cut back all the dead limbs and the things that are not producing any fruit, the tree would then prune out and grow more and become more faithful and become stronger in that pruning process? And it's the same thing with us. When we get to a place of rest in God, he begins to prune us and cut off the stuff that's not like him. But if we're never resting, we never have a period of pruning. We never have a period where God can come and say, hey, let me deal with that for you. Let, let, let me cut some of these things back. And pruning also means pruning in life. We've got a lot of access, a lot of extra stuff around us in our life that we just don't need. Some things that we can cut out and cut away so that we can really rest. You know, I'm like that. I love to get up early in the morning, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and start my day. And I'm just a going, and I'm just a going, I'm just a going, I'm just a going. Eventually, that's going to catch up with me. It can catch up to me in the form of a heart attack. It can catch up to me in the form of diabetes. It can catch up to me with a form of kidney disease. It can catch up to me. So when you are resting, you're giving the molecules, the DNA, all those things in your body an opportunity to regenerate and rest. And it gives God an opportunity to come in and prune out the stuff that's not going to help you grow. And what the world has done was tell us that we don't need rest. We got everything out there now. Red Bull. I mean, you got more energy drinks now than anything that you have ever seen in the market. And they'll tell you. And the thing, what, and look at what they do with their commercial marketing, right? With their commercial marketing, when you drink Red Bull, you become like an angel and you yeah, get yeah. wings and you can fly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they're, taking, they're taking what God had designed for us and flipped it. And said, now you don't need rest, but if you drink Red Bull, you become angelic and you become Christ-like. And you can do it all, all the time. It, and we buy into it. And we buy into it. And, and, and so, in a semi-circle, you're not going to be able to swing into a full circle. i tell you what we want to do. I want to I wanna go into this a little bit in Scripture. If we would quickly, somebody quickly grab your Bible and go with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 22. And whoever gets there first, just stand on your feet and read it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 22. 
God bless them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. I want to focus on that word fruitful for a minute. What does fruitful mean? <laughs> People that believe that that word fruitful meant go out and make babies. But it meant to be productive. God designed us when he placed us in the kingdom of the Garden of Eden. He wanted us to be productive. To go out there and do things and otherwise work. But in doing that, the first full day that we were with God was a day of rest. So if we had that day of rest with God on Saturday, our first full day of work began on Sunday. And he said, what? Be productive. Now, when we're productive for Christ, we're going to be fruitful. And everybody see how that's working? You're going to be fruitful. Because later on in the Bible, it says, what? You know those that what? Labor among you by what? The fruit that they bear. Never gets to, come on now. The Old Testament always points to the New Testament. So in the very beginning, he said, be fruitful and multiply. In the New Testament, in the Old Testament, it said, be fruitful and multiply. In the New Testament, it said, but we'll know you from those that labor among you by the fruit that they bear. Be fruitful and the fruit that you bear connects in together. But if you never rest, you can never truly be fruitful. Next scripture, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Mm -hmm. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth. He mm -hmm. purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Mm -hmm. Now ye are chosen through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye, abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. No. Without Christ, no. what? You can, you can nothing. do nothing. Yes. We are connected to him because he is the tree, we are the vines. Mm -hmm. And during that pruning process, during that period of rest, God comes in and goes, okay, you don't need that. The church goes through a pruning. Uh -huh. We couldn't move apostolically with some of the folk that was here. Now, as painful as the pruning was, because sometimes you just hate to see folk go, if it ain't nothing but for sure numbers. Let's just be real about it. Folk, and, and that's what I tell people all the time. The folk, they say, oh, well, I don't worry about numbers. Are the folk that never seen numbers. Are the folk that never seen their ministry multiply. At the folk that never seen their, their ministry flourish and grow. Those are the ones that I don't worry about numbers. You, okay, don't, don't worry about it. But you, it, 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 if it's just you and the same five folk that started, then you got issues because you're not multiplying. That's right. You're not being fruitful. Mm -hmm. and, and that means either you're a dead vine that got cut off and you laying down there on a the branch and you think you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell people, yeah, we can go on there and say, just like the young lady that had the conference up in Racine. I was, I was, I was ecstatic for them. Over 200 folks, and that's the first time she ever done anything. And she was following me around, Bishop. What did I? Did I? You know, I'm not here to critique you. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not here. That I'm coming here to enjoy. But since you asked, you know, the, look at the, the and and they did a wonderful job. Wonder, nothing wrong with what they did. But when I told her, she's like, Oh man! And I said, But you know what? Count the numbers. Know how many folk were here so that you can plan your next event. Don't go around and say, I'm not worried about the numbers, because that's a lie. Anyone that tell, I'm, I'm telling you, even myself, I ain't worried about the numbers. That, yeah, you do worry about the numbers. You want to see your ministry be fruitful, and you want to see the people multiply. As the folks that ain't never had nothing, ain't never going to have anything. Now, if all the seats are not filled up, I fill them up with angels. I'm always full. Because I'm looking in the spirit. Amen. But in the natural man, we also got to be real and be about being fruitful. Also about the tree, in the Bible, it talks about the tree being planted, what? Close to the riverfront. So that the roots can go down deep and get the water that's not seen. We got to be that way too. So when drought comes, we can withstand that period. 
But guess what they also say that's also talking about resting. If you don't get rest, your body's not going to be able to endure stress when it does come. We're talking about both the physical and the spiritual. See, folk want to talk about being so holy and holier than thou, and so spiritual, that we forget to address the physical in the people. And then we'll run folk to death. Sometimes, as angry as Elder Lucy will get with me, I'll tell her, not today, sit down. You're not doing that today. Rest. Pope and Bishop, you know, someone else has got to do this today. And, uh, and because you can see it when they run down and, and run them in the ground. You know, I asked Dick and Tony, we're supposed to hang up pictures, right? We haven't gotten to it yet. I'm not going to chase that man of God down. I know how busy he is. And I want to see him rest. Because if I keep running him in the ground, worried about some pictures being hung up, he's going to burn out. So we've got to understand that this period of rest, both in the physical and the natural, in the physical, which is the natural, and the spiritual, is important. Because when you began to rest and abide in Christ, reading his word, understanding his word, and it's going to be able to saturate in your heart more. You understand what I'm saying? You're going to look forward to that period of rest. It's the same thing with fasting. If you run out there and just say, I'm going to start fasting today, and today is the day that we're going to do it. We're supposed to be starting to fast today. But as a leader, I know the church next door blessed us. I ain't going to put that thing in the freezer. When we leave here today, after we eat our cake, we can start fasting. But if you started this morning, I'm not going to tell you nothing. You get what I'm saying? you got to use wisdom. And it's the same thing with your rest. You've got to have that period of rest. And I'm getting better at it. Yesterday, I went home, and at the end of the day, I said, you know what? I'm not doing anything else today. I'm going to rest. Because your body physically needs that. And we got to get to learn how to rest properly. I'm guilty of it. I talked about it earlier. I can't, I feel like I can't rest without the television being on. So in fact, that means I never fully reach a full REM sleep. So I'm, so when you wake up in the day, you want to know why you're still tired. It says your room's supposed to be completely dark. They even tell you to tape up the alarm clock, you know, because the LED lights are, will, you know, shine the time. They say even take that up. It should be, com and if you go into how we used to live back in the day, and how we were back in cavemen days, caves were dark. You go into a cave, when it get dark, it's, you, can't, you can't even see your hand in front of you. Out at sea on a ship, go outside in the middle of the night. You can't even see your hand in front of you. You can see the stars and the moon on a good night, but you can't even really see your hand in front of you. That's the way we're supposed to rest, and we're not doing it. Because we're so busy. All the gadgets, all the social media, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I see some folk on that beat. I'm like, what? Yeah. You get up in the morning, your Facebook thing is full. And they're like, what were they? And then you go back and look at the, what? People don't sleep. God delights. God delights in the blessings of what he creates. When we go back and we look at Genesis chapter 1, he blesses all living creatures and man with what? Fruitfulness. There's not a creature on this earth that cannot repropriate. There's not a creature on this earth that doesn't have a job to do. Bees make honey. Spiders, if a bee flies into a spider trap, the spider eats the bee. Everyone has a role to play. And God has it all well planned out. If we just get out of the way and like the cycle of life operate, we'll be amazed at what can happen. It's when man steps in and, and, and began to alter what God created, then we start messing things up. We start messing up that rhythm of life, which we have done. We have taken God out of everything. They don't even want our children to rest. They don't even want them to have a moment of silence in school anymore to pray. If children pray over their food in school, they tell them, well, you can't do that. I'm thinking, how can you tell? What do you mean by you? I... We can't pray over the food. <laughs> We can't pray over the food. They even want to come out now. You know what? I know the atheists are about to lose their mind because the number one movie in America was Godzilla. They probably got a movement now to take God out of Zilla. They just want to call him Zilla. <laughs> <laughs> you think about that for a minute? Right. They got to be losing their mind because yeah. Godzilla is the number one movie. So they're going to go ahead and protest to take God out of yeah. <laughs> Make it Zilla. 
But we have to be aware of that. And the way, and even in our workplaces. Now, when I was in the Navy, one of my main things were I took a nooner every day, which is a nap. Every day at one, at, 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 and in fact, when I became in charge of my division, lunch was from one to two. Mm. Yes, I, I gave, yeah, from, from, from 11 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that was lunch. Because from 11 to 12, I took a nap. From 12 to 1 o'clock, I watched Young and the Restless. And then from, <laughs> <laughs> and then from 1 to 2, to, then from 1 to 2, I, did, I, I actually went to eat. So I had my whole day planned out, what, but I rested every day. And we have to develop those things and develop that time to, to be able to rest. And as I got older and got more into the Word, I eliminated young and the restless and took that time and made it Bible time with God. But early on, Victor Newman was like, my God. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I, wouldn't miss, I, I would miss church, but I wouldn't miss young and the restless. Now I have to ask Cheryl, what's going on? I, she, nine times out of ten, she don't know. But if you don't develop that time to rest, and you have to teach that to your children, it's okay. Remember babies, when they, when they first born, they will sleep when they're supposed to. Not when they're first born, but after a while, they, they get the little rhythm thing down. And they will nap throughout the day. You notice as they get older and older and older, the nap stuff start going away. Now you can't get them to take a nap because of all the stuff. And that's just another way that the enemy creeps into our lifestyle and takes that away from us. Go work in retail right now and tell them you can't work on Sundays because you go to church. Mm. You won't get that job. They'll find somebody else quit. You won't get that job. But 20 years ago, just 20 years ago, malls were closed on Sunday. Malls were closed on Sunday. There's a business, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is one of the few Christian businesses that are still closed on Sunday. And then I'm going to show you how hypocritical some folks are. And I don't mean to pick on anyone. Everyone understands that Hobby Lobby is in a very big cat court battle right now with the United States government about abortion. And they don't want to pay for it, any of their employees, to be a part of a health care plan where they have to pay for abortions or birth control. And they don't have anything to do with that. But Hobby Lobby is open on Sundays. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy? So how can you institute the Bible on one instinct? Yeah. But you don't institute the Bible on this one. Government going to eat them alive on that. God, if I was a lawyer, I wouldn't talk about so 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 this part of the Bible you're willing to enforce, but this over here, you, because this deals with you making money. This don't. Right, 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 right. Uh oh, because it all comes down to money. They don't want to pay that part of the insurance thing, and I'm not saying whether they're right or wrong, because I'm not, I'm not into that debate. I'm I'm not even getting into that debate. I believe in what the Word of God says. Right? And the word of God, and that, that, that's it. So, I, and it says thou should not kill. So I'm just going to leave that alone. All right? And I believe that any, any, anything that's the sanctity of life, anything outside of that is murder. Period. Now, whether they want to keep it legal or not, that's not up to me. But, if we look at it in the natural sense, the government got it. Because if I was a lawyer, that's the approach I would take. Why would you want to enforce that? But you don't enforce that. So Chick-fil-A comes along and they go, I'm not going to be open on Sundays. I'm going to remember the Sabbath and I'm going to keep it holy. And if you work here, I, if you work here, I would prefer that you not work on Sundays. That's, what they, that's their company policy. And do you know Chick-fil-A is more profitable than Burger King and McDonald's put together? And they're not open on Sunday. How can they still make money? But they're not open on Sundays. The world would have you think that they would be the underdog. But per capita, their stock is valued higher than that of McDonald's and Burger King put together. Isn't that amazing? Because that's how God operates when you observe it. So when we're talking about the life-shaped semicircle, to know how to balance our time between rest and work. 
because we're designed to rest and then work. And what does rest mean? Rest means abiding in Christ. Abiding in the vine. Because without Christ, we can't do anything. Without Christ, the work that we do is irrelevant. Without Christ, the, the life that we live is irrelevant. And if we abide in him, he will abide in us. The word abide means live, to dwell within. So if we dwell within Christ, he will dwell within us. And it will be a reflection of our life. And when we rest in him or abide in him, it will reflect the kind of work that we do and the fruit that we produce. I have a friend of mine at work that we talk every day. You know what he said to me the other day? He said, Mike, you know, just talking to you, I feel like I need that, that I, I need to go to church. I'm like, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I ain't never mentioned it to him before in my life. I don't Bible thump folk. I don't run around and tell people over and over again, time and time again, what they have to do and what they have to say or what they have to be in order to be a friend with me. Mm -mm. But I pray that I can be an example to them for them to say, hey, I want a little bit of what you got. I want a little bit of what you got. My junior, turn around, sit up and sit back. Don't you even think about getting up. Don't even look at him to play. Sit back and don't even start. So, we ain't got to cut that one out. <laughs> so, so, when we're resting in the Lord, we're abiding in the Lord. And he abides in us and we abide in him. And guess what? We produce fruit. Because if that young man starts to go to church now, I said that wrong. When he starts to go to church, God will begin, and guess what? The fruit of my labor. Mm -hmm. The fruit of my labor. Right. Now folks say that when you rest in the Lord, they want to tell you what you have to do when you rest in God. I say, you just get your favorite scripture out. And you began to read over that one scripture. Whatever it may be. Uh -huh. And once you get that one scripture really inside of you, God will give you another one. And it may take some time. I was stuck on John 3.16 I, for, for a year or two. I just could not get over it because the way it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he believed that will believe in him will have life and life everlasting. I could not understand the concept of God loving the world so much that he would give even more. The one who created, for me, that just messed me up. But then as I began to read that thing, I understood that God so loved me that he gave Jesus for me. Then I started making that thing because I was resting in the Lord. I was resting in the Lord. Another thing about work is work validates people. Work validates people. You, you, you run into someone and they will always one-up what they do at work. <laughs> most folk, I'm serious, most folk, if, if you run into someone, they go, what do you do? Well, all of a sudden, you're no longer a field service technician, you're a field service engineer. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're no longer a receptionist, but you're now an administrative assistant. Yeah, yeah. You're no longer a, a, a janitor, but now you are, a, a, you, you, you are now, what do they call them now? They don't call engineer. them, you're a maintenance engineer. Maintenance engineer. Or you're a build or you're a facilities technician. <laughs> they have, you know what, they have, you can't, you, you, because work validates who you are. You're not a substitute teacher, but you're a teacher. Because work in this society validates who you are. But it's in exact contrast to what the Word of God says. The Word of God says it's not your title at your position, but the fruit that you bear that validates who you are. So as Christian folk, we've got to be careful of title and position. I, you know, you, I saw that up the other day. I saw that the other day. One of the pastors from New Jersey posted on her Facebook page, if you go to church, what work do you do in church? And I didn't answer. I just sat back and I watched all the other answers come in. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a this. I'm a that. Everybody had it. And no one said, I'm a worshiper. Because that's what we should come to church to do, worship. Right. 
That's our job. In fact, God created man for the whole purpose of worship. But, even though he created us to worship, what the first day we what? That's amazing, isn't it? You would think that God would have put us together and said, okay, now worship me for creating you all day tomorrow. All day today. He didn't. He said, no. My baby, I love you so much. Go rest. Now the world has it going backwards. I got to work. I got to work. The Bible addresses work later on as well. It says that if a man don't work, he don't eat. Word of God says if a man does not work, he does not eat. Mm -hmm. So when we go, and so someone tried to trick me. And they said, Well, Pastor, if the Bible says if a man does not work, he doesn't eat. So those panhandlers down there in Chicago or New York is always out there saying, spare change. They shouldn't eat. I said, No. They work. Because they work. Mm -hmm. they work. That's right. They because they, that's their job. They're working. And I can guarantee you that they got a better rhythm of life than we do. I guarantee you they rest a lot more than we do. Not in God, though. We don't know that, though, Elder. We don't know. We don't know. Just because they're panhandling out there shaking don't mean they're not godly. Because I'm, I am truly, absolutely convinced that God has people on every level of the spectrum because of his glory. If you're filthy rich and you are a billionaire, mm -hmm. God should be your glory. Yeah. If you ain't got two nickels to rub together, God should be your glory. I don't you can't you can't judge it based on where they are or what they look like. Because God could be because you don't know. There was a man in Chicago, specifically, I read about this in Moody, one of the Moody magazines, that what he did was he would shake his little can and whoever would put money into that can, he would say, God bless you. Have a great day. Mm -hmm. And there was a man that worked in a building that was kind of well off. He was one of the top executives in the building that always looked for that man so he can go put money in the coin because he needed to hear that man say to him, God bless you. Mm -hmm. He was blessing. The, he would put money. So one day the man wasn't there anymore. And, the own, and, and this guy went looking for him. Found him <laughs> in the hospital. The brother had gotten sick. He went to that man, paid all his bills, took care of him. Okay. When the guy got out of there, okay. he went right back to, God bless you. Because the guy that, and, and then when they interviewed him, they said, well, why did you do all this? And he said, every time I put money into this thing, it was like I was going to church. So he was ministering to him. Mm -hmm. Now to us, we'll see him, that's just a poor man out there, and but to, but to the man that he was given to, now check it out. He was what? Fruitful in his labor. Exactly. Because of those kind words. And because of those kind words, he was blessed and covered when he got ill. So we, 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 we don't know how God operates. We don't know how a kind word going around just telling a person, God loves you and so do I. God bless you. Giving them a word. Now when those folks come up there to me and they ask for some change and stuff, depending on who they are and depending how I'm led on the spirit, I may say, come on in here. Let me, uh, I, I like what Pastor Candace said. Pastor Candace said she'd be out sometime in the spirit of the Lord to go, bless this person. And she'd be like, how, Lord? Fill up their gas tank. Pay for their groceries. Do this, do that. Give them this, give them that. And she just goes and do it without question. I've done that sometimes, but I haven't gotten to the point where I'm not questioning God. I'll be like, why you want me to give him that, God? <laughs> give him what ink pen? I ain't give him that. <laughs> Lord, but when you're resting in God, you can hear God clearly speak. Because sometimes God will tell you, you're going to bless somebody today. And you'd be like, what? Who, Lord? And the Lord said, you're going to bless somebody today. And then you driving around looking for somebody to bless. You get into your natural stuff. You looking. And, and, and you be looking and looking and looking. And it'd be the, it'll be a person out of left field. And God will be like, bless them. And sometimes, and see, we always say a blessing is, is, is we, we related to money. But I remember one time the Lord told me to bless this lady. And all I did was to go up there and tell her, you are beautiful. And don't let anyone tell you something different. 
the Lord told me to tell you that you're beautiful. And that was the blessing. And I didn't understand. Because we have got to stop thinking that God kind of takes things in the way that we can understand it. Especially when it comes to pruning. Lord, when this church went through a pruning, I thank God for Pastor Bolton because I was about to lose my mind. I was crying out. Oh, Lord, why would they, why would they do this to me? I didn't, and he said, do what? Oh, they took everybody. They done left and then now they out in town talking about me. And Pastor Bolton said, would you just get, get a grip? And man, you, 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 are you, he, and he asked me, are you resting in the Lord or are you thinking about your own mind? I go, what? He go, who left you? Uh, no, no, who left? Out of the original seven folk that sat at your kitchen table to help you start that ministry, who gone? Well, there ain't nobody. He said, ain't nobody left you. We will follow you to hell and back. We really believe in what you're teaching and what you're preaching. Stop crying and worrying about those people that left. They were never with you in the beginning. And he said, now what you need to do is go get some rest and hear from God. And I hate it when Pastor Bowen pulled out my life shapes on me, because I know he's right. Because he said once you rest, the work will take care of itself. Everybody with me? It is important that as Christians, that as humans, that as people, that we get into this thing and rest it. And that we abide in Christ and he abide in us. Things will become clearer to you. It will become clearer to you. Be fruitful. Be fruitful in your labor. Be fruitful in your reading to God. Be fruitful in your study to God. Be fruitful in your Bible. And some folk will tell you, oh, you got to read this every day. You know what? There's going to be some times when you just are resting in God, you don't even have to pick up and open your Bible because he's going to minister to you while you rest. <laughs> Those scriptures are going to flow to you right. right in your own memory. He'll just begin to speak to you. And, and you, what I love about God is he'll read his word to you when you're truly resting in him. When you're truly resting in him. Okay, next week. Next week we're going to be talking about the life-shaped triangle. This is one of my favorite ones to teach. Because I'm going to teach you about balancing relationships. Balancing relationships at work, at home, at school, with your spouse. I'm going to teach you how to balance your life in a three-dimensional way. And as you learn how to balance this thing, you're going to be looking at things differently. You're going to be looking at things three-dimensionally, and you're going to be talking about up, in, and out, and how that relates to you in, in, in every situation. And I want you to do, I want you to make up a day today. No matter what day your Sabbath is, you, we have to pick a Sabbath day. Pick that day, make that your Sabbath day, and really rest in the Lord. And I know that in today's society, it's difficult to get time off from work to tell them, hey, I can't work on this day because today is my Sabbath. You know what? And that's one thing I can say about Jewish folk. They remember the Sabbath and they keep it holy. You can't get them to do anything on a Saturday. Nothing. Zach, zero, <laughs> it ain't happening. And, and you also got to understand that the true aspect of time, I'm going to go back a page here, of a 24-hour period, a true 24-hour period is from sunset to sunrise. That's a 24-hour that, that's period. Sunset to sunrise. So the Sabbath for a real Sabbath is sunset on Friday. I'm sorry, from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday. It's sunset to sunset, not sunrise to sunrise. Uh-oh. Oh, that's radical, isn't it? That's cause, cause we, we've all been taught different. So even understanding the periods of a Sabbath, we have it all mixed up. And that's why we got the whole thing with Easter. Now, and again, I taught this on Easter Sunday morning. It's cool. It's cool that we celebrate Easter on Sunday. I don't have a problem with that. I'm fine with that. But we have to teach the people the truth. Mathematically, there is no way that Jesus died on Friday and rose on Sunday. There ain't three days in between that. The reason why the tomb was empty is because it said Jesus rose on the Sabbath. The reason why it was empty on Sunday because he got up on Saturday. 
So if he got up on Saturday, he was in the tomb for three days. He had to be buried and put in there on Wednesday. So Good Friday never existed. Now, is that, now, now that you know that, is Good Friday wrong? No. It's a tradition. It's something that we did to observe. But we have to teach the people the truth. And that's what people are afraid of. Wait a minute, Bishop, how can you say you're talking out both, you, you, you got to take one stand or another? No, I don't. I just got to go by the word. And the word says three days. So if it was three days and he rolled on the Sabbath, which is Saturday, he rolled sunset Friday night. So let's say if sunset was at 6 o'clock Friday evening. He rolled 6 o'clock Friday evening. Therefore, the tomb would be empty on Sunday when she showed up. Y'all with me? Which is said the day after the Sabbath, which is what? Sunday. Now that we know, and if you know the truth, then you can say it's okay to celebrate it on Sunday. But know that he rose on Saturday. It's okay to celebrate it on Friday, but know he was killed on Wednesday. It's okay. There's nothing, because it's tradition. It's just something that we do. Everybody with me on that? So just knowing those facts help you to understand those things. Human beings, human doings. We're human. DNA. So because we're human, we're going to go do human things. And God delights in the things that we do when we do it. Remember resting in work. Remember abiding in faithfulness. When you abide in Christ, he abides in you, and that's how your faith grows. Pruning and growing. In order for you to grow in Christ, he's going to prune some of that worldly stuff away from you. Some of the things that you all used to do, some of the things that you all used to do, you're looking good there, Pastor. Look. Man, I love that black and gold. Let me interrupt you. To God, no, no, brother. You look marvelous. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> come in, man. Come in, man. Come on up. Hey, look, we, we got to get this on camera. I'm, I'm, I'm a, look, I'm going to get my hug. Happy Father's Day, man. Hold on. Shabbat 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 God bless you, man. Bring your rape for Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus I love you, man. Hallelujah. See, we're radical and crazy. We like Jesus. That's right. That's right. You can interrupt Jesus and ask him a question. The squires of Pharisees did it, uh -huh. but then at the same time they did it out of love because they yeah. were ignorant because they didn't know that he was the living God, My right God. in the presence of them. You could come to him and ask him anything. Amen. Hey, but if you walk up to a mirror, it would be just like this: say, "Oh yeah, you look." <laughs> 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 Ladies, I love every one of you in this room, but this is the greatest day of the year. Great. Amen. Amen. Because it's Father's Day. Because it's Father's Day. It's Father's Day. Hey, it's Father's Day. <laughs> Baby, I love y'all, but we wouldn't be fathers without mothers. <laughs> yeah. That's why he let your day come first, but he remember what the script say. He don't you know he saved the best for last. <laughs> We didn't get a chance to pray together this morning, but that, that's what brothers do, Amen. And, that, and that's genuine love. Amen. I hope you got that on tape, man. Yeah. Um, but that's how we roll. We want to rest and work and pruning and growing. When you grow in Christ, he's going to prune. If we can get rid of the stuff that keeps us from God and keep us from growing in our faith, mm -hmm. we would do it. Amen. We would do it automatically in a heartbeat. But we can't do it because we don't have that ability to do it because sometimes we waver in our faith. But as we abide in Christ or rest in God, he begins to move that stuff off of it. There's things, man, that I thought that I could never live without when I became a Christian. I don't even miss him anymore. I don't even miss him anymore. You know? and, and, but it takes time. People, because they misunderstand the scripture. They said, you know, once you become, once you, once you accept Christ in your life, you become a new creature. Old things are put away. Yeah, I've never said those old things won't wear their ugly heads up again. You want to say that those, as, as you're sitting there, those things won't come back on you and you start thinking, oh man, yeah, I, I used to remember. And then you got people that will come back and say, remember when? Remember? No, I don't remember that. No, why, why you going to bring it up? But as you abide in Christ, your faithfulness will grow. And as your faith grows, the pruning process grows and you grow. Amen? Remember to rest. Rest on your feet. Let's give God some praise real quick. Happy, happy Father's Day. I got a good, oh, we got a word, we got a word, we got a word. We got a word, we got a word. 
we want you all to fellowship. We're going to take a few minutes and get set up for service and everything and, and get with who all we're going to get and give the others an opportunity to come on up and get us out of here. Uh, I would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge our own apostle that's in the house. It's good to have the man of God back in his right to place. I want to give God some praise. very own Apostle Bolton to come on up and to close us out from Sunday school in prayer. Thank you, sir. God bless you. How y'all do? How y'all doing? Amen. Good morning. Praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another time together. Now, Lord God, we ask you to bless us as we leave from this uh, celebration, Lord God, to move into the next. We ask you to continue to bless us open our hearts to renew our mind, Lord God. Let us speak what you would speak. Let us say what you would say. Let us go where you would go. Let us do what you would do. Not our own, but your will be done. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, and let every heart say amen. 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 God bless you. Fellowship time. Oh, I'm so you smart to the bone. God bless you, sweetheart. Oh, Amen. You got it. 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 You